Another fun match today. Uh, today we have two 0 and 1 players looking to redeem themselves. Um, this is going to be a lot of fun. The first, um, because we keep things fair here, is the guy that I beat. Um, no, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, he's a really good fighter. We're happy to have him back, Jake Marangoni. Jake, how you doing? Yeah, I'm doing pretty right? well. Yeah, yeah, it's it's well, Marangoni. Chris Clark said it was Marangoni, and that really got to me. But um, I don't know if I would consider myself a good fighter. I mean, my first match, I I I did just the bare minimum of fighting. Um, I um, I'm looking to redeem myself. Definitely, and the man he's looking to redeem himself against, he is also zero and one. He is an admin of the league, and he is somebody who is also looking to get revenge. Robert Parker, Robert, how you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, you're damn right when it, you say I'm looking to get revenge. My first match against Alex was uh, maybe, you know, not the least controversy-filled match in the league's history. Um, so, I mean, Alex is definitely a good fighter. He deserved the win and all that good stuff. But I will not be looked over, and I am here to fight tonight. Well, that's good. Fighting is good. Yes, yes. Fighting is the answer. Right. True. It really is. Okay, guys, so what we're going to be doing, um, for those of you who don't know the way the game works, we're going to have four main game rounds. Uh, fighters get about five to six minutes each round to fight it out. At the end of that, if the score is three to one or two to two, we're going to move on to the speed round. If not, the four zero, then we're going to have a knockout victory to the winner. So for the first question um, of today's match, doing a real good job at hosting so far. What movie scene makes you the most mad? And we're going to start with Jake on this one. Jake, opening argument. What movie scene makes you the most mad? This is tricky because there's really two ways you can look at it. You can look at it in the subjective, or oh, this film is doing it the wrong way, or you look at it in the film's reality, the film's universe of this is making me mad because these characters are doing this. And I went with the latter because I think it's more faithful to the you should feel mad. And I went with Saving Private Ryan in the finale scene where Upham, he basically fails at doing what he was supposed to do. In the ending of the film, I'll just bring up the speed. Oh, spo spoilers are allowed. You can spoil it. Yes. Spoiler alert for the ending of Saving Private Ryan. A really good film. Check it out. Upham is called for ammo from two of his comrades. They're in a building and they're out of ammo and German soldiers are barging their way up into the building. So Upham is there and he's just on the side and he's scared. He's not scared because of his death. He's scared of killing. He's not a he's not a he's not a killer like his comrades. He's afraid to kill. He gets so close to helping his comrades. Already the German soldiers are in the building and they've already shot them they've already shot his comrades and they're he's afraid to kill. It's, it was this close. It was this close to actually saving his allies. And in the end, he was too afraid. And in when I was watching this, I was just so mad at the characters. I was just yelling at the screen, just saying, just save them. You're so close. You're just going to get in there and you'll be fine. And in the end, both of his comrades die because of him. And this, this earns the audience being mad. All right, good opening. Robert, we're moving on to you. All right, so Jake kind of defined that argument in his opening statement, and that's that's kind of what I agree with. You can take it in two ways. You can either be angry at uh, the characters and what they're doing, or you can kind of be angry at the film and saying, you're doing this wrong, this is something you should not be doing, I'm angry at this movie for doing this right now in this instance. I'm doing both. All right, I am arguing for both of these points because the scene I'm going with is in episode two, Attack of the Clones of Star Wars, when Anakin and Padme are on Naboo and they're in that dark lit room and Anakin is trying to seduce her in the stupidest way possible with some of the worst written dialogue in film history, which I will quote in character in the main round. But the point is... I can't wait. <laughs> the, the point is, uh, Attack of the Clones is one of the worst written movies ever made, and this scene 
literally, a lot of people give the sand line a lot of shit, but this scene is the culmination of everything that went wrong with the prequels. It's terrible acting, terrible direction, it's terrible story building, it's terrible screenwriting, it is everything that makes you angry about the prequels, and everything that makes you angry about the ruining of the potential of the Star Wars story, all wrapped up into one awful scene, and that's why I'm picking this scene from Attack of the Clones. All right, guys, with that, we're going to move into the open round. You guys are going to have six minutes to debate this one. Time starts when you begin to speak. All right, I'm going to get on my Hayden Christensen voice here. <clears throat> From the moment I met you, all those years ago, not a day has gone by where I haven't thought of you. <sighs> and now that I'm with you again, I'm in agony. <sighs> the closer I get to you, the worse it gets. The thought of not being with you. I can't breathe. I'm haunted by the kiss that you should never have given me. My heart is beating, hoping that kiss will not become a scar. You are in my very soul, tormenting me. If you are suffering as much as I am, please tell me. If you follow your thoughts through to conclusion, it'll take us to a place we cannot go, regardless of the way we feel about each other. I will not let you give up your future for me. You're asking me to be rational. That is something I know I cannot do. Believe me, I wish that I could just wish my feelings away, but I can't. This is some of the worst writing in film okay, history. Okay, I have to call. I have to call call something there. I'm gonna reset the clock and re restart. Yeah, the that's scene. fine. Sorry, I had that to get was, that in. No, I just have to say that was something else. <laughs> I didn't know that, Adney was British. I'm kidding. We're gonna start true. the match. Back. Anyways, anyways, I okay, I'm. I'm not a professionally paid actor. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, so that, that Aaron's reaction there is actually perfect. Um, I didn't, wow, oh my gosh, I, wow, I don't know, how is that a thing? Oh. Exactly, that's in this movie. Those quotes, those lines, that dialogue, that acting, that delivery is in this movie. It's the worst part of this movie. There's a lot of bad parts in the movie. There's a lot of bad parts of the prequels. There's some to like in the prequels. Not a lot. This culminates everything that you hate about these movies because it's Hayden Christensen trying to act, but really it's just Darth Vader who has a boner and is a little kid who's having a panic attack because this girl that he's liked since he was a child doesn't like him back. I don't want to see Darth Vader as a kid with a boner, and that's what this scene displays, all right? That's what makes me mad. And also, it's just the fact that they put this in the movie, this terrible, terrible writing, it's Natalie Portman not giving a shit about the role and just reading words off of a page. It is terrible. Not to mention, she is in an extremely skimpy costume, and that's sexism in film. So, Jake, if you're arguing against that, you're going to argue against sexism in film. So, I got you in a corner now. Um, <laughs> as for the Saving Private Ryan thing, uh, it is a really disappointing scene in the sense that you are really rooting for this character to go do his duty. But in the same sense, you, you also understand the emotion of the scene and why he doesn't want to. It's the same reason that you really understand the motivations in a movie like Hacksaw Ridge with somebody who is afraid to kill, afraid to harm people. You know, either way, they're people. It's a real moral argument that's brought into the scene. There are veterans who have been quoted saying that this is the most accurate scene because it's early onset traumatic stress disorder. Like, there, there's a reason behind the scene. Yes, it's disappointing that he doesn't do his duty for his country, for his friends, for his comrades, but it also makes sense. His actions make sense as somebody who's very young in a war scenario with all of this bloodshed around him to just break down on his knees with stress the thing about the scene is that he's this close he's this close from saving his allies because i he's this close and i feel like that's a really big deal he he's he could have done it he could have saved them but he didn't and it's not because he's afraid of dying it's because he's afraid of killing in the end he's i would say the problem with with the Attack of the Clones, is that you're not necessarily mad at the film. You're, all, all the characters, I don't think it's an earned, like, hatred towards the film. You're mad at the writing, you're mad at the directing, you're mad at George Lucas more than you are the characters. I feel like that's not the best way to be mad, because it's like, it's like, you know, James, when he, when he makes the fridge. You're not mad at the film. You're mad at for George Lucas and Spielberg for coming up with this idea. I feel like it's not mad. It's, it's more cringe. 
and more well, cringing at the dialogue. And in the context of the film, it's poetic. It's beautiful. It's like it's, uh, it's Shakespeare. Hold on, you just call that scene poetic and beautiful, and I I'm sorry that argument doesn't hold water. The story, in the context <laughs> of the film, Lucas is okay. doing a love story to show the rise and the fall of Darth Vader and how he became Darth Vader. And I feel that is a part of characters, him falling in love. In the context of the film, this is how this is how they find love. This is how Anakin found Padme. There's so, a conflict in the fact that she's a senator and that she and that Jedi's are not allowed to marry. Exactly. So I can be I'm still I'm mad at both the filmmaking. So even in your opening argument, you said there's two ways to look at this, and I'm arguing for both. I'm angry at the filmmaking that they put this terrible uh, this terribly made scene into the, a terribly made film, but I'm also angry at the characters because Anakin in the first movie, it's shown that all he wants in life is to be a Jedi. He wants to be up there. He wants to be the best that there's ever been. Like no one ever was. He wants to be the greatest Jedi of all time. He wants to learn how to use the force. He wants to help people with his power. Yet in this movie, we see him betray everything that the Jedi hold dear, especially in this scene. So I'm angry at the characters. First, I'm angry he's at- a broken character. Character. Okay, it's but then, and, and then Padme in the first film, and then a Padme during in this scene says that she brings that up. She says, "You're studying to be a Jedi. I'm a senator. This cannot work." And then she gives in. She submits to him, which is even worse. That's even more sexism in the film. So yes, I'm angry at the film, but I'm also angry at the characters. I'm at me angry at Padme because there is nothing likable about the way that. Uh, Anakin Skywalker is portrayed in these movies, yet for some reason she falls for him. Yes, there is such thing as love is first sight and attraction and all these stupid things like that. But at the same time, like, if there's no redeeming qualities, you just said he's a broken character. If there's no redeeming qualities of a broken character and he is professing his love for you in the most worst writing ever made, in the cheesiest, stupidest writing, stupidest acting ever made, just why would you give in to that? You're giving in to this child who is 20 years younger than you who wants to get in your pants. You're you're giving in to that. So that's why I'm angry at that character. And yes, of course I'm angry at George Lucas for putting in this in the movie. I'm arguing with a double-edged sword here. Um, and once again, for the Saving Private Ryan scene, Yes, he was that close, and he is scared of killing, but there have been poems written by Vietnam veterans about how they are afraid of killing, because war is a moral thing. Just because they're your enemy, just because they have a different viewpoint of you, does that justify killing them? So, yes, he's afraid, but rightfully so. This was purposely put into the film to evoke an emotion, a moral quandary. This is what the scene is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you angry at the character. It's supposed to have you question your own morality in a wartime. All right, and that is actually perfect because that's going to be time on the round. Um, we're going to go ahead and go to Jake first for closing arguments. Go ahead. Okay. So in Saving Private Ryan, Spielberg knew that there had to be some sort of reversal of expectations. We all expect. We've all seen this the scene before. The character is afraid. The character knows that he has to do. He has to has to resolve this situation. He has to. He has to man up. We expect to see that. We want to see that. That's our expectations already set. And that's what Spielberg did so perfectly. And so when he decides to reverse our expectations by actually the character essentially being empowered and not man up, we're shocked because we, we realize that our expectations almost, they didn't, they, they went back around and they affected us. They, we were expecting this happy ending because we've seen this, the scene before. And the fact that Spoomer was able to reverse that and make us realize that, that that's not how reality works, that's not how war is, that makes us realize that we want him to succeed. We want to see him to kill the Germans. And he doesn't. That was, that's what makes him human. And that's what realizes that we're not just yelling at the audience. Um, we're not just yelling at the film. We're not yelling at the characters. We're also yelling to ourselves. We realize that there's a part of us that wouldn't, that would do exactly what Upham is doing, and that's not attack. And that's when you realize, that's when you feel as mad as the characters or as the audience as you realize that I may be in the same situation as him. That's why you'd be mad, because you would realize to yourself that you're not as, you're, you're just as a coward as Upham is. All right, Robert, go ahead. 
All right, so I don't think that Upham is a coward. I think he has early onset post-traumatic stress disorder, and I think that's messing with his mind. I think he is, uh, I agree with you with what you're saying as far as um, it, it makes the audience put themselves in that position. Oh, would I have the morality to kill somebody that I don't know? And even though if it means saving my friends, um, but at the same time, that's not a reason to get mad. You shouldn't be mad one, the question is, what movie scene makes you the most mad? You shouldn't get mad at reverse expectations. There are reverse expectations in film and TV all the time. Look at shows like Game of Thrones. Look at any countless number of films that don't give you what you expect, whether it's from a trailer, whether it's from other characters you've seen. Just because they don't give you what you expect doesn't mean that that's the scene that makes you the most angry in film history. Whereas in Attack of the Clones, you're angry at the characters for abandoning their principles, like Padme. You're angry at her for abandoning her is principles. You're angry at Darth Vader with a boner, and you're angry at George Lucas for putting this terrible scene in the film. All right, and that'll do it for the round. Uh, great job, guys. Definitely taking two different <laughs> approaches there to this argument. Um, and, and I, 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 I like that. What did you say? You mean you hate both of them? <laughs> I, yeah, no, they're they're awful. Um, yeah. Okay. I, so I don't know. I do a mean Padme. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so as, as much as I just want to give to an argument, <laughs> as much as I just want to give Robert the win for that Padme impression alone, um, <laughs> it is much harder than not even the Anakin one, the Padme one specifically. That'll be a gem moment forever because That's Padme went that. more Padme went more British than Carrie Fisher did in those original movies. That was something else. Oh, um, thank you, Alex. I want to thank the Academy. I'd like to thank my mom, who really encouraged me. Robert uh, Robert Parker's acting career will be part of the In Memoriam segment at the Oscars <laughs> this year. Um, uh, really? Those lines will be his famous clip. Um, <laughs> no, all, all jokes aside, though, um, that's, a, that's a hard thing to do, all jokes aside. But, <laughs> yeah. um, hmm. it, it really was a, a point of Jake picked a scene where it's you are looking at the character and you are looking at the base action of what he does and him not completing the task he needs to complete upsets you and makes you upset and it makes you mad and it makes you angry at the character. Whereas Robert took a standpoint of you have a lot of bad decisions filmmaking wise that lead to this awful, awful scene that makes you hate both these characters and hate what they're doing because of what the filmmaking did. And it was definitely an interesting standpoint, and I think you guys both definitely argued it really, really well. But it was something that Jake said in his closing where it's the intention of the filmmaker to go against what you expect. And obviously reverse expectation is something that we see all the time. But it's, it's, and Robert, this was a part of your argument. Part of the reason you are angry at the characters is because it is so poorly made that it affects the way the characters come out on screen. Jake's argument is that the filmmaking is so well executed that it makes you angry and it makes you feel emotion towards this character and the actions he commits and the things he doesn't do rather than the things the character does do because of bad filmmaking. So I'm, I'm going to give the point to Jake on that one. But it was definitely yeah. a close one. Oh, yes. <clears throat> that was a real tough one. Yeah, and that was a good fight. That was a good fight. Uh, and, and, okay, ju just to, uh, to, to spare controversy here, um, that was not Robert's original choice. His original choice was yes. Martha. Mm -hmm. Martha yeah. from DBS. Yeah. yeah. I took um, much of my that um, notes been, and stuff in the morning. That would have been an even harder fight. That would have been even yeah. more of an uphill battle. Um, Save Martha. Yeah, and it would not have led to as good an impression. So that's true. I can't do I can't do Henry Cavill like I can do Natalie Portman. Let's be real, guys. Definitely. <laughs> um, just just the best. And we're gonna move on to question number two. Um, you know, uh, Morgan Freeman is a great actor, but sometimes you don't always pick the best movies, the best roles, and. Uh, Sometimes you uh, you just don't bring the passion like Robert does to your roles. And the question here is, what is the worst movie starring Morgan Freeman? And uh, we're going to go to uh, Robert for this one. And I like this because these are two movies that uh, for 
I was gonna say for better or for worse, but for worse, nobody remembers either of these. <laughs> <laughs> for better, no one remembers any about, of these. That's sad though, because one of these is very recent. Robert, go ahead and remind Extreme. us. So speaking of extremely recent, um, in my opinion, the worst film of the last five years is this movie that stars Morgan Freeman, and it's called Ben Hur. Uh, ben Hur is a remake of a remake. Um, it, the 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 Ben Hur storyline is a little bit weird because there was the original, and there was a remake in the fifties that is now considered the original, and then there was another remake that literally nobody asked for ever ever, uh, and the director who I'm blanking on his name it was um Tim um but he was like hey uh let's remake Ben Hur. Like, let's just do that. That'll be fun. Um, so they remit Ben-Hur and shit on the legacy of this amazing story. Ben-Hur, the 1959 version, is heralded as the, the torchbearer, the standard bearer for storytelling in film. All right? It is... Movies are made to tell a story. They're made to evoke emotion. They're made to tell the story of these characters, these amazing characters. They're made to have the audience connect with these characters. And that's not something that 2016's Ben-Hur did at all. It is a terribly made film. I'll get into more of it later. It doesn't hold up a year later. The original Ben-Hur, the 59 version, holds up 60 years later. This is an atrocity of film. It is a terrible, terrible storytelling piece of cinema. And that's why Ben Hur is the worst movie starring Morgan Freeman. All right, Jake, is yours worse? Uh, um. Hmm. Well, you remember a little film called Dreamcatcher? Because I unfortunately do. It's absolutely befuddling that the director of the film is Lawrence Kasdan, who wrote one of the greatest. I guess one of the greatest films of all time, The Empire Strikes Back. He also wrote Force Awakens. This guy's known for making writing and directing great films. He directed The Big Chill, which is one of my mom's favorite films. It was co-written by William Goldman, who wrote another Stephen King film called Misery, which I'm sure we've all heard of. And he also wrote The Princess Bride, which is based off his own novel. So these pairing seems like one of the best choices ever. This is going to be a great film. It's based off a Stephen King novel, and it's about four kids who grow up with a mentally handicapped friend who gives them telekinetic powers. And there's also an alien invasion in a small town, and Morgan Freeman's the general trying to make sure that no alien gets out of this town. It is one of the weirdest films of all time. Roger Ebert gave it a horrible review. I think it was one of the worst films he had reviewed in, I think it was 2003, the film came out. Absolutely one of the worst films he had ever seen. It stars Thomas Jane, Damien Lewis, Jason Lee. It's absolutely terrible. It's about aliens. It's incredibly hard to explain. And for the longest time, I forgot that Morgan Freeman was in the movie. I feel like that is why it is the worst Morgan Freeman film, because you don't even know that you forget that he's in the movie. He didn't care about making this. He probably wanted to make it because he was working with... Florence Kasdan. It is an absolute atrocity. And I and I think it was Lawrence Kasdan or on the on the on the cover of the, the DVD, it says Dreamcatcher will do to toilets what Jaws did to the ocean. Some some something like that. I, I may be misquoting, but it is that, that's a terrible, terrible, terrible Stephen yeah. King film. Yeah. <clears throat> Five minutes on the clock, time starts when we begin speaking. All right, so first off on Rotten Tomatoes, Ben-Hur, not that Rotten Tomatoes is the be-all end-all, but it's a good guide to go off of. Ben-Hur has a lower rating than Dreamcatcher. Um, as for, you literally said it in your opening argument, you said you forget Morgan Freeman is in this movie. The whole movie is forgettable. I will take forgettable over actively terrible. Ben-Hur is actively terrible. I'll take a movie that I don't remember a thing about over something that is actively terrible and shitting on the legacy of a storytelling monstrosity that is the original Ben-Hur. Uh, I have asked people, like other friends that we've met through these trivia leagues and these debate leagues and things like that, I said, hey, have you heard of Dreamcatcher? Is that 2003 movie with Morgan Freeman? Nobody knows what it is. I will take exactly. that. 
I will take forgettable over actively terrible. It says, wor the question is, worst movie star in Morgan Freeman. Your, both of our movies star Morgan Freeman. Nobody remembers yours. Not because it was terrible, because it was forgettable. People remember mine because it was so bad. Your movie, there are actually good things in it. Um, the score, which is written by James Newton Howard, he's one of the most over underrated film composers there is. He has a great Absolutely. score for that movie. He has a great score. If you were talking worst Morgan Freeman performance, if we were talking worst performance by Morgan Freeman, I would give this to you, but we're talking worst movie that he is in. You have in my movie it halfway through it turns into a religious film because they meet Jesus. Like that was what, what happens in the original film. Ben Hur has always been about Christianity. It, it's, it's always been a historical epic. It's never had the focus on original. It's always had their themes rooted rooted in family and in betrayal. This is something that the new version absolutely doesn't even have. They changed the entire ending. The whole movie is about how um, the the guy played by Toby Kebbell, the brother, the adopted brother, uh, betrays his family, gets half of his family killed, gets his brother sent into slavery, and his brother is in slavery for years and years and years and years, and then comes that's back. That's a great story. That, that sounds is a great. great. That, that, great that's a great story, problem. but the execution, that's a great story because the original Ben-Hur is fantastic and perfect storytelling. This Ben-Hur yes. is absolutely wrong because this movie is not rooted in those themes. Because at the end, they're all like, oh, I got you uh, enslaved for years and years and years, and then you come back and try to kill me, but now... I almost died, and now we're all buddy buddy. Like that's how the movie ends. The last fifteen so minutes the of this point of the film is forgiving, forgiveness, because no. Jesus teaches Ben Hur to forgive. Because there's a scene where he's taken the cross, and he's about, and he falls to the ground, and Ben Hur comes in and gives him some water, and he grabs a stone, and he's gonna throw it at one of the soldiers. He's like, no, he's like telling him that this that's violence not in my movie. The answer. That's not in my movie. Uh, that is in the original. That's, in that's not in the remake. That's, no, it's that's, not. That's in the original. That's not in this one, though, which is why I'm saying those themes are not in here. That's not in the remake. That scene is I, not I'm in the movie. Sure. I saw sure. it. I don't know if you did or not, but I did in theaters, and that's not in this movie. Uh, your movie is why completely you forget. The exactly, because it's so oh. bad. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't mean to be using that in my Yes, I saw this movie in the theaters, but yeah, Dreamcatcher yeah, yeah. Dreamca Dreamca is completely forgettable. I will take forgettable. Yeah, and Robert, you punish yourself. It's true. Uh, uh, I will take forgettable 10 days out of 10 over a movie that is actively bad, that doesn't have those forgiveness themes, that doesn't have those betrayal themes, that doesn't have those, like, remembering the past themes that the original Ben-Hur has. It doesn't have the great historical epic storytelling. It, this movie is just terrible. The visual effects and the, the what should be the most thrilling scene in the entire movie, the visual effects of the chariot race. Chariot race? Yeah, the chariot race doesn't hold up less than a year after this movie came out. The original chariot race scene still holds up today, over 60 years later. This, the visual effects in this movie are terrible. The acting is terrible, even from some halfway decent actors like Morgan Freeman, Toby Kebbell. These are halfway decent actors that are given terrible, terrible roles, terrible writing. The fact that this historical epic, this standard bearer of storytelling, was remade to this atrocity without any of the original heart or original themes, and everything was mixed up and changed around in the worst way possible, make Ben-Hur the worst movie star in Morgan Freeman. You have redeeming qualities in your movie. You, ac you actually do have some good themes about growing up, about your friendships, about loyalty, about things like that, but your movie has a great score by James Newton Howard. Your film has you good cinematography. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. There's terrible editing in this movie. Watch Ben Hur again. There is no cinematography in this movie. The entire chariot race is like they were like, all right, let's film a chariot race, put the camera on a horse's head, and then pushed over the horse. And they're like, all right, now we're, oh, well, that's our take. Done filming. We're, that's a wrap. That's a wrap. The chariot race is over. Oh, uh, that's fine. We don't need to include all these like iconic moments, like the Jesus moment. Like, all right, time. Oh. Wow. I guess I have to close, don't I? Yep, yeah, Robin, <sighs> you're first. Go ahead. All right. I said it in my main argument, and I'll say it again. There are redeeming qualities about Dreamcatcher, but at the same time, Jake has said it himself, it's forgettable. You forget Morgan Freeman is in that movie. Half the people I've ever talked to, more than half, have never even heard of that movie. It is utterly forgettable. You don't remember a thing about it except the amazing James Newton Howard score. And 
it's just forgettable. I will take forgettable over actively bad, over actively ruining a storytelling icon any day of the week. And Drake? Um, I wouldn't say that the score's amazing in Dreamcatcher. I mean, James Newton Howard is almost like a, charm a chameleon. He's just able to adapt to whatever film he's working on. And I, the score is just, it's passable. It's fine. You, you kind of notice it. You kind of don't. I think that Dreamcatcher is really the worst Morgan Freeman film because you forget the film exists. That is absolutely worse. It's when we talk about remakes and what is the worst remake, we usually look at something obvious like, I don't know, The Thing or... Not, not the John Carpenter one, the newer one, but I guess that's more of a prequel. But newer remakes. When you forget something like Total Recall that was remade, that is why it's the worst, because you've completely forgotten it. I feel that is why Morgan Freeman didn't care about that movie, because he was just, he wanted to work with Lawrence Kasdan, and that's why that film is absolutely terrible. You forget about it. I feel forgetting something, forgetting a film even existed is worse than just a film being like, ah, I hated it. Burn Her has good cinematography. The directing is fine. Tim of Beckham, whatever the Russian's kind of name is, he's a good, stylish, visual director. He directed Wanted, which also had Morgan Freeman in it. It was a collaboration thing. He has dreadlocks in the movie. I can tell you what Morgan Freeman looked like in Burn Her. I can't remember how he looks like in Dreamcatcher. He's got freaking dreadlocks. He's having just a blast. All right. Uh, just to clean up there, uh, the director's name is pronounced Tamur Bekemetov, if I butcher the actual pronunciation, but phonetically that's what it would come Bekemetov. Okay. But very long. Um, all right, so uh, this one was was easier for me than the first one. Um, Robert took this. He, he absolutely yeah. bashed the living hell out of Ben-Hur. <laughs> and then put your argument, which which it was a good argument, the idea of it's so bad, it's forgettable. And then he took that and kind of really turned it around on you. Um, no, he... I'm, if we take anything out of this video, at least Robert had a hell of a time just bashing the shit out of Ben-Hur. <laughs> really I think that's why you just wanted to, to be in this match, just so you could talk about how much you hated Ben-Hur. That's not a lie, by the way, that I saw it in theaters. I saw it opening weekend. I saw Ben-Hur opening weekend in theaters. You can't yeah, anybody else with you. Was anybody else in that theater? <laughs> My sister and I saw it together. Because that was the summer after I stopped working at the movie theater that I was at. Um, oh, so but, she had to be there. Well, she... she Yes, she uh, still worked there at the time. <laughs> no, she, she, she still worked there at the time. So I saw almost every movie that summer because um, of the perks of working there. She was able to take me and we'd go see movies together. And that's mm -hmm. one of the ones we saw that open Friday night. I'm so sorry. That's awful. <laughs> yeah, um, I saw the trailer for Ben Hur, and in the there's a scene where Jesus is in it, and uh, Ben Hur helps him out, and then he's like, "No, don't, don't use uh, violence." And I was like, "Okay, so that must be in the movie." And that was in, I think it was like the second trailer, but I guess it's not in the movie. And yeah, I haven't seen it. And, yeah. there, there's a scene where they see him, like they're up on a hill, and they see him walking, but I don't think he ever approaches him. Okay, because that was in the trailer, and then I just assumed it was in the movie. Yeah. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what I want in trailers. I, I just have to say, I love Robert's description of the, the filming of the cherry race. They just put a camera <laughs> and knocked over. No, 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 the reason I say that is because um, I haven't read the whole thing, but there was like a five-paragraph essay-style thing here about the filming of just the chariot race on Wikipedia. Like, they go in-depth as oh, fuck yeah. on this one. Season. Is this in the original? No, this is for the remake. Oh, wait, which remake? Though? Like, the Cherry Race and the remake the, has, like, a whole friggin' essay well, thing. The 2016 version? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. This is just, you know, like, that just, like, again, research. I haven't seen it. I don't hate myself that much, so I haven't seen it, <laughs> but, um... That's, that's understandable. This looks fascinatingly bad. It, it is awful. Don't watch it. I, All right, as somebody talk... who saw it that opening day, don't see it. All right, now let's talk about some good movies and not shit. Yeah. Um, mm. That time. What is the most emotional movie ever? We talked about getting mad. Now let's just get straight emotional. Jake, we're going to you first. Um, this is easy, I think. It's The Shawshank Redemption. One of the greatest films of all time, directed by Frank Garibald, written by Frank Garibald. A score by Thomas Newman. 
cinematography by Roger Deakins. The Shawshank conveys every type of emotion that we all feel. We, we, we feel rage when Andy is sentenced to two months in solitary confinement. There, there may be spoilers ahead, so if you haven't seen Shawshank, please see it. There's it's fear over 20 years old. I think we're safe. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope so. There's fear when Andy is assaulted by the sisters. The sadness when Brooks is released from Shawshank and his eventual suicide. Joy when Andy escapes Shawshank. Happiness when Red and Andy reunite on the beach in Ziwa, Ziwa Tanejo. It shows us the ups and downs of a man who is convinced, who's convicted of a crime he did not commit and how fear will hold you as a prisoner, but hope shall set you free. I just want to take hey, and we'll go to Robert. Yeah, I just want to mention that he just used that wasn't him. That he just used that tagline at the last line there. But it's a good tagline. It's a good tagline. You can't it's deny that. Tagline. It's a good tagline. Unfortunately, it's not the most emotional movie because the most emotional movie is Inside Out. Um, there's there's a couple different ways that you can frame this argument uh, as most emotional movie. Um, there's three ways in uh, my damn, opinion. I hate semantics. It, well, it, it, this isn't a semantics argument. Um, there's no, no, no. there's, well, there's going to be semantics in this. There's three ways you can frame the argument. The first is what movie makes you feel the most range of emotions, whether it's uh, whether it's separately or all at the same time in a mix of emotions inside yourself. That's one way. The second way is the magnitude of those emotions. If you're sad, are you morose? If you're scared, are you terrified? Are you petrified? If you're happy, are you feeling bliss? There, the the magnitude of those emotions uh, is another part you can play. The most emotional movie, the one that makes you feel the most magnitude. Uh, maybe or maybe not. The third one is which of these two movies literally has main characters that are feelings. Uh, that's that's not my argument. That's just a joke argument, but I, I wanted to throw it in there. So Inside Out absolutely uh, checks the first two boxes. It makes you feel all of the emotions all at the same time in multiple different facets. You didn't think that you were going to feel such heartbreak when Bing Bong dies. You didn't think you were going to feel such heartbreak when their family gets reunited. But then you feel bliss when you see them all together again. There are so many different range of emotions, and the magnitudes of those are huge. So the, the different range of emotions and the level to which you feel them at unexpected turns and points in the film is undoubtedly why Inside Out is the most emotional movie. Okay. All right. Well, time starts when you begin speaking. This is probably a controversial uh, opinion, but I think Inside Out is one of the most overrated Pixar films. Uh, well, that's in Toy Story 3, so don't worry about it. Um, the most overrated Pixar well, hey, film. Hey, is hey, 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 hey. Um, Let me. I don't think you're right about that, but. That's a different fight. <laughs> Okay, well, Stay on human target. emotions are much more complicated than Inside Out shows us. They look at five simple human emotions, and it's that distinct emotions designed for children. This film I... is mainly for children. I am an adult, okay? And I have watched that film, and I just do not understand the just enjoyability be... of just the Just because the character... Just because the characters are those five emotions does not at all mean that those are the only emotions that are shown in the film. You have fear in the class. No, no, that's not. When do you feel disgust in that film? You don't. You feel angry, you feel fear, you feel and sadness. Like, watch the film. What? Oh, cut. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Anyways, here's the thing. You you didn't even pick the most emotional Frank Darabont movie in the 90s based off a Stephen King adaptation. Because that's the Green Mile. The Green Mile no, is absolutely not. more emotional than Shawshank Redemption. Shawshank is about an innocent no, man in prison. I know what it's about. I know what it's about. Shawshank Redemption has you feel one emotion the entire time. Yes, it's a huge magnitude, but it's one. No, and that's yeah. anger at the judicial system. You're angry when he's convicted. You're angry at the institutionalization when Brooks has to kill himself. And when Red gets released, you're angry that's at his... That's not he sadness. He kills himself because you know that's the only way out. That's sadness. I watched and this movie. Like, when, Red, when Red, when Red um, is, is released, he I feels sad movie he cannot... Today. I watched this movie yesterday, and the only yes. the only emotion really I felt how great it is and how it, emotional and inspiring. I'm not going to argue. Shawshank is a better movie than Inside Out. Inside Out is far more emotional. The themes in Inside Out, 
Okay, Shawshank makes you feel one emotion that's angry at the judicial system. Because when they're talking about being institutionalized and how Brooks uh, killed himself because he didn't feel like he belonged in the outside world, that happens today. People are incarcerated who are innocent today. People are institutionalized and then released and commit suicide or go back to prison because that's the place where they feel like they belong today. Institutionalization happens today. You don't feel any emotions except anger you feel the magnitude feel but you warm. don't feel the rank you, you feel sadness because andy is is put in prison because he did nothing wrong you that's not sadness that's anger escapes. it's uplifting i know all not, i feel is all i feel is anger when i watch that movie i'm angry at the judicial system all i feel is disgust when i see inside out <laughs> i all i fear feel is anger at the judicial system because these things are still happening today from a film that was a it took place in the 40s 50s and 60s these things are still happening today because there are still people extremely wrongfully treated in prison yes when he escapes you feel good for the character but you're still angry you feel that freedom you feel no you don't you still feel angry you because it took him that long you only feel anger in this movie you feel angry at the warden you feel angry at uh, you feel angry you feel at happiness when he commits suicide. You do not feel happy. No, you do. You, you say you feel, you feel happy that he finally justice finally prevails. Justice never prevails in this movie, though. He, it does, only, though. Okay, so let me, let me restructure my hey, 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 you've had like two minutes to speak. Go ahead, go ahead. Brandon, the whole film is a deals with the friendship between two people, Andy Dufresne and Red. At the end of the film, they meet at the beach and they reconcile because they haven't seen each other in, I think, like years, I don't know, a couple years after Andy had escaped Shawshank. Both of them reunite because the film is about hope and how it, how it trumps everything, how it trumps fear. And the, the whole point is that Red, at the end of the film, realizes that hope is a good thing because throughout, throughout the film, it was like, hope is a bad thing. It poisons people's minds. And at the end of the film, he decides to, to um, break his parole and he feels like hope is finally there. And when he meets with, with and you Andy, still... you reconcile, you see the happiness and the joy. And as the camera pans out from the beach, the music is uplifting, it's inspiring. It's an absolute inspiring, uplifting, you, you just, still... a crowd, just a, a crowd-pleasing film that everybody right. loves because it has so many emotions. When, when I was in release... I, I, when I'm finished, let me finish this. When I was in year 11, we watched this film in religion class. I saw a couple people cry when uh, Brooks committed suicide. I saw a couple of people yelling at the screen when Andy was sentenced to two months in solitary confinement. I saw fear. I saw people shocking, getting shocked when Andy was assaulted by the sisters. I saw everyone starting to cry at the end of the film. That is what an emotional movie is, is when you see these different types of emotions throughout this one film. I feel like that is why it is the best because it is sad, it is uplifting, it is tragic, it is heartbreaking, it's inspiring, it is everything huh. that a film should be. It's that only is why is the emotional, the most emotional film of all time. It is about everything right, that time. humans struggle. You can start. Right. We're, we're gonna go to. You wanna let Robert start closing? Yeah, 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 yeah I feel like he started. He started this round. Okay, Jake. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Oh, because I was really good. Inside Out is a very, is, when I watched Inside Out, I felt disgust because it was a simplifica simplification of five emotions that, that, sh that kids would understand. It doesn't look at confusion. It doesn't look like at lust. It doesn't look like all of these, it doesn't look at other emotions that humans feel. There are a lot, there are a lot more complex films out there like uh, Synecdoche or Adaptation or, or even um, smaller films like, um, or what's the Robert Redford film, All Hope is Lost? The one about the sailing? There's there's films like those that are emotional that, that deal with these tragic problems. Inside Out is for children who are just understanding these human emotions. And it doesn't get more complex than that. Our main character isn't really a character. She's a vessel for these five emotions who only have one emotion. That's not something I really care for. It simplifies human emotions to the five basic ones so that children can understand them. And really, that's not how the world works. Riley is kind of hard to relate to as she isn't necessarily, she's essentially the vessel for the five emotions who control her. She's been controlled throughout the entire film. And throughout most of the film, she acts crazy and kind of unlikable because she almost acts like she's, she has bipolar disorder. Inside Out isn't as good as everyone thinks it is. 
Shawshank, absolutely the most emotional film ever. You feel inspired. You cheer at the film at the end. It is one of the best. All right, uh, Robert, you're up next. Just to correct, the film you were talking about is All Is Lost. Yeah, okay. That was close. All right, so in your closing there, you said a couple of things that I'm just going to mention really quickly. Um, I think you have a personal vendetta against Inside Out, and you're attacking the film itself and not the emotions that it portrays. Um, you talked about how it doesn't display lust. Well, she's an 11-year-old girl, so I wouldn't expect it to. Oh, um, almost like um, creepy. Um, that, and they mentioned that at the end. They mentioned puberty at the end of the film. So there you go. Uh, in When it comes to confusion, she absolutely feels confusion. When she's about to get on the bus to leave, she feels confliction within herself when she's about to steal money from her parents she's about to feel confliction in herself uh you feel humor with the gum commercial with bill Hader's performance riley you said riley is not easy to relate to she's so easy to relate to she's all of us because we've all felt these emotions we all understand the theme of the film is that you have to in order to feel joy in order to feel the magnitude of bliss to feel so happy that you could cry you have to understand what sadness is first and you get that in this movie like i was saying in my opening you get a range of emotions all at once i've given examples for when you feel fear what for when you feel anger in the movie when you feel sadness and happiness she is so easy to relate to because she is us. As for Shawshank Redemption, I think you made a very, very good argument on why it's your favorite movie and why it's one of the best movies ever made. I absolutely agree with those points. That That's not the question. That's not the question. The question is the most emotional. I think there are movies by the same director, by, this, uh, by the same author of the same short story, and made in the same decade that's better. I said The Green Mile is more emotional than Shawshank. I think you made a very good argument for why Shawshank is a very well-made movie, but as for evoking a range of high-magnitude emotions, Shawshank does not do that for me. It only makes me angry at the injustices that are still happening in the judicial system, and of course, my movie has feelings as characters. So therefore, uh, just another joke answer, it is, of course, the most emotional movie, because it really does convey a range of high-magnitude emotions, whereas Shawshank makes you get very, very, very angry for the entire time and then uplifted at the end when red and andy unite this is not my argument i just wanted to point that out that it's you know agreed. that's fair I, I i all right uh great round guys the most emotional <sighs> I, need, I need a room to shut out that was too um, easy it was way <laughs> too easy that you joke thing not, just made it too easy you know it's not easy this round oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, um, seriously though, you guys both make great arguments. Um, I think you guys both explained your reasoning as to why your film runs the range of emotions um, very well, and I, I think you both did a great job on that. But he did call you out on it in his closing, and I, I have to agree with it. I think Jake got a little lost on his dislike for the movie more than discussing the emotion of it, whereas Robert was attacking, even if I, I don't agree with it personally, he was attacking the emotion and his feel on the emotion, I think. And I, and I, I think Jake got caught up more on talking about why he had a dislike for the movie instead of specifically on the emotional portion of it. I did but say it, it did signify emotions. But, yeah, but then um, I counteracted all those in my closing. Yeah, he, <laughs> it, it, it was close. It was, it was I close. The, I, I accept the, the, the argument. I just want to mention that you did have a personal hatred towards Ben-Hur in our previous... That is true, argument. but you didn't point that out in the last argument. Yeah. Uh, it's all about what you I said. Now, that's, what, so that's what I've learned from both hosting and from being in the hosting chair and being in the competitor's chair. If you don't say it, it can't count whatsoever, which is yeah. where I but, failed... And, and, that's where and, I feel that, that is where I have to come in on it because, mm -hmm. like, just personally, I completely disagree with what Robert's saying about you only feel one emotion. I, I disagree feel, with what I was saying, too. I, feel I, had, I had to make an argument. There are, sometimes yes. you got to play the game. There, You have you, to make you, an argument. You do, feel play, the full, the you do feel the full range of emotions, but I also disagree with what Jake was saying. Inside Out was my favorite movie of that year. I disagree Ooh. with him. That's overrated. Yep. But it's it's all a matter of opinion. I just think he got a little lost. Yes, exactly. I was certainly the minority fair, then. I didn't think I was going to win. Thing, I, I tried my hardest. The one thing I'll give him, 
the one thing I'll give him is when the movie is about emotion, sometimes it, it might be hard to differentiate what the movie is from the emotion you're feeling, mm -hmm. which I can understand a little, a little bit. Because that's a kind of... Yeah, I don't yeah, know. I'm, I'm, I love, I love Shawshank. Oh, who doesn't? But once, I, yeah, I honestly, really, doesn't? I, I do believe that Green Mile has more emotions than Shawshank does. I do believe that. I haven't seen Green Mile. <laughs> you should. I, I, I definitely should. Oh, I've seen Shawshank. Shawshank. Michael Clark Duncan. About it. Uh, this next. All right, guys. We're gonna move on. So the score is two to one, and now we're moving on to the final question. This one's interesting. So, um. With the overwhelming success of Justice League, he said sarcastically. With the uh, with the uh, mediocre returns on Justice League um, and a uh, possible loss of a lot of money, uh, why stop here? DC's probably still going to continue, and they're going to keep making movies. Just God hope they get better at it. But um, with that, let's try and help them get it get a bit better at it. We you know we obviously know that there's a Green Lantern core movie in the works. The rumor is that they're going to have Hal Jordan and John Stewart be the co the co leaders of it and kind of pair up as the protagonist. So, who should play them? Who should pair up as Hal Jordan and John Stewart within the Green Lantern core movie and take over these leads? Robert, you're going to open first on this argument. Go ahead. All right, so this is a really interesting one. Um, as somebody who's not too extremely familiar with the Green Lantern characters, I actually did a lot of research going into this on what those characters really are and what defines their characteristics, both physical, emotional, what their story arcs represent. I did a lot of research into this, and I think the best casting that you can have is Matt Damon and Terrence Howard. So Matt Damon is Hal Jordan and Terrence Howard as Jon Stewart. Um, there's a lot of reasons why, and I'll get into those more a little bit later, but I think it's worth noting that, you know, both Academy Award nominated actors, both characters that have held their own, uh, both in leading and supporting roles, which I think is important coming up soon, uh, in both leading and supporting roles in uh, comic book films and action films. Um, I think they're both amazing actors dramatically and comedically, which is also important for these two characters' relationship between each other. So I think it's got to be Matt Damon and Terrence Howard. All right, Jake, go ahead. When you look at the two characters, there's a there's a good way you can kind of view the actors that they're going to be cast because it's based on who the characters are and what kind of film they're going to make. And I went with and and the success of the actors who who, who they want to play how Jordan and John Stewart. And I decided that I reckon that it should be Army Hammer, just coming off the critical success of Call Me By Your Name and as Hal Jordan and Denzel Washington as John Stewart. I feel Army Hammer would be perfect to play this cocky, self-confident pilot who becomes the new Green Lamp. And then Denzel Washington would be a wise mentor teaching Hal Jordan the ways of being a Green Lamp. It would be very similar to how Men in Black did it. Kind of Men in Black, but it's it's Green it's the Green Lantern Corps. Ami Hammer is just coming off the success of Call Me By Your Name. And we've seen in the past directors and actors who make these great small indie films, they usually go on to work on bigger projects with Disney, Marvel, or DC. Tom Holland did The Impossible, and then he was Spider-Man. Jeremy Renner did The Hurt Locker and The Town, and then he, and he was Hawkeye. Ezra Miller was in a great film that I love called After School, and he also did We Need to Talk About Kevin and The Perks of Being a Wallflower, and then he was The Flash. Diego Luna did the Alfonso Cuarón film It's Your Mama Tabien, and then he did uh, Rogue One. John Boyega, who did Attack the Block, is now in Force Awakens. You want to get someone who's been doing these great small films, and the search you know it isn't a small film, but that is one of critical success. You get them to make, you, you realize that that, has, that actor is not only just a good actor, but it's someone who has a promising career. That's why he would be perfect as Hal Jordan. And Denzel Washington, he's a veteran. He's been making films for the past four decades. He's one of the best actors working today. You said that both of your actors have been nominated for Oscar. He's won for acting, not Matt Damon for just writing. Denzel Washington has won, and not just once, but twice, both for Best Supporting Actor and Best Actor. His films make a lot of money, meaning that he's not only bankable, but it also helped DC because their box office hasn't been the best. 
it would also be a great passing the torch over from one Green Lantern to another, very much like Matt Black. That is why I think Denzel Washington and Army Hammer would be perfect as Al Jordan and Stewart. All right, you guys are going to have five minutes on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. All right, so I think the biggest problem with your pick is Denzel Washington. He's too old to play. Yes, um, John Stewart is supposed to be this sort of rugged, uh, um, over-calculating character, but uh, first off, I don't think there's any way that you put Denzel and Washington in an action comic book movie today at the age of 62. I don't think that happens because any time that Denzel Washington has tried to do a um, like a genre film, like a comic book film or anything like that, it's never worked. He sticks. You said he won two Oscars. Yeah, he's good at sticking in the realm of dramas and staying there. He's still trying to win his Oscar back from Casey Affleck. He's too busy doing a comic book movie, or he's too busy to do a comic book movie right now. He's too old to be put in this action comedy, uh, road, you know, comedy comic book film. He's just too old. Whereas Terrence Howard is 48, and we've seen him. He has already proven himself in a comic book role in Iron Man. He's already proven himself in a comedic sense and in a supporting sense. If you have Denzel Washington as Jon Stewart, he has to be the lead. And I don't think Jon Stewart, when Hal Jordan is available, I don't think Jon Stewart uh, can lead a movie like Denzel Washington would demand to lead a movie. Terrence Howard, on the other hand, would be great in a much more supporting role, as we've seen that he's great in doing before. As for Army Hammer, he... It gets really annoying to see perfect people be perfect. You have to do somebody who's a little bit more rugged, a little bit more weather than Army Hammer is. And you said somebody who has a promising career in the future. No, Army Hammer already has tons of success. He, uh, I thought he was great. And he would have more success if he, if he, he would have more success. He makes these big films because of how well Call Me by Your Name is doing. But at the same time, that's not that wasn't his big success. He's also been in things like Social Network. He was in Jay Edgar. <laughs> He was in Entourage. He was in Man from Uncle. If you're saying this is going to launch his career, his career has already been launched. This isn't. This isn't. Army Hammer isn't the type of person who's going to see this as a stepping stone. He is somebody who already. I think he knows what kind of roles he was born to play, and that's sort of the 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 gruff uh, character that he was in something like uh, Man from Uncle, or the more dramatic role like he was in Jay Edgar. When you see perfect people being perfect, it gets annoying, especially in a day and age age where we have 60 million comic book movies a year. I wouldn't be excited if they cast Army Hammer as Hell Jordan. I would be excited if they cast somebody who has proven himself in a comedic sense, who has proven himself in an action role, a true action role, which Army Hammer hasn't. I would be excited for somebody like Matt Damon, who has been in the business and knows how to work in both a supporting role, or sorry, in a lead role, like he would be, and Ter with a partner like Terrence Howard, who has already proven himself in an action comedy comic book film in a supporting role. I don't see Denzel Washington and Army Hammer working together well. I think Denzel is far too old and far too stuck in his ways of the dramatic sense, and I think Army Hammer isn't proven in this kind of genre film, and just Denzel doesn't make genre films work. Okay, now I'm going to have to talk to you, because Tommy Lee Jones was in Men in Black, and I don't know how old he was when he was in the first one, but that is based off a Marvel comic, and he plays the same character that I'm talking about in this Green Lantern film. It was a much lesser oh, known comic book. He was passing the torch. That was, is what I said. He's passing the torch from Jon Stewart over to Hal Jordan. That's why I think Denzel would be great as the mentor role because he has that, that he's, he's got that age. He's got that versatile. He's wise. That's why he would be perfect as the cold, calculating Green Lantern. And you say he doesn't make genre films. Did you see any of the films he worked with Tony Scott, like Man on Fire or Unstoppable? Or the t did he do the taking of film in one, two, three? But he's made films like that. Although they might not be critically acclaimed, they still have done, they've proven that he is a versatile in different genres. But also, DC can I needs you? somebody who's yeah, like, okay. hey, well, let me Let me speak. Go ahead, go ahead. What was the last, in the past five years? Can you remember a Terrence Howard film? The last five years? Yeah. Uh, when exactly. was the Past five years, he, okay, but he there, want there, there are other actors and directors but who have come out from. Work, he doesn't want to work for DC after how well Marvel treated him in Iron Man. They they teased him like he was gonna he was gonna be War Machine in prisoners. Iron Man Two. He was in Prisoners. Man. Prisoners. Okay, fine. That was one film. That's one and film. That's, that's a great film. film. And you have one There's film. Tommy Hammer has one film. Success. 
Army Hammer What's has that? one film. What's that? Call Me By Your Name? No, that's Man From U.N.C.L.E. That's Army Hammer's one film that he shows that he can be proven in this kind of a setting. What about Lone Ranger? What about Lone Ranger? Like an Lone action... Ranger, no. Absolutely not. Fun film. And no, really, uh, oh yeah. Well, I don't think he Matt Damon... Good in that movie. Be, Matt Damon wouldn't be good as Hal Jordan because I think he's I think he's a little too old to be playing this main character. He needs to be in, in at least his 30s. To okay, time? Like five sequels. Oh, jeez, that time went by quick. Yeah, it did. All right, guys, we're going to go in closing. Robert, you're up. Yeah, just give me a second to gather thoughts. Uh, then can you... I go, or are you going to... No, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Just one second. Oh, yeah, yeah, cool. And don't worry. This entire time, I have been researching ages, award nominations. I have all that at the end. Okay. Everything you guys have brought up, I'll, I'm checking this out. Cool. So, so you, you bring up Lone Ranger. You bring up Call Me By My Name. Call me by your name, excuse me. Um, I brought up Man from Uncle. I brought up Jay Edgar. It, like I said, it's annoying to see perfect-looking people do things that are perfect because our everyday average people aren't perfect. Army Hammer has gotten some critical ex uh, critical acclaim, especially with Call Me by Your Name, but that's in a dr more of a dramatic role. <clears throat> he absolutely did not get critical acclaim whatsoever in Lone Ranger. That movie did not get a lot of critical acclaim at all, unless you're talking to Quentin Tarantino, and. The fact of the matter is, DC needs critical acclaim right now. It needs big names who have been proven in these roles before, who can come and bring charisma and bring a following to these roles. Denzel Washington doesn't have, he's a fantastic actor. He's an amazing actor, but he doesn't bring charisma to a role like this. He's too old for this role. He doesn't bring charisma to this kind of role. He hasn't been proven in this kind of role. Army Hammer is too type. It's too typecasting. DC likes to go a little bit off the rails. It doesn't like to hit those. That's better pretty much it, it. He doesn't. DC needs somebody whose name is known. If people say, "Oh, Army Hammer is the new Hell Jordan," people are going to say. And Terrence Howard is an actor. Most people. Know I, I'm sure. doing my closing shush. Um, sorry. Sorry. Our Army Hammer, I didn't mean to snap at you there. Um, no, it's fine. Uh, I, you, I, you, I snapped at you before. It's fine. Uh, Army Hammer has not been proven critically in a role like this, in a comedic role especially. The relationship between Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart, as much it is, as it is a mentor to student, it is a comedic role. You want to remake Men in Black. I don't know why, but that's what it seems like you want to do. Men in Black was a good movie. It was a much lesser known Marvel property. The Green Lantern Corps is a much, much more well-known, much more well-respected well, well property. So when you bring in a name like Denzel Washington, who is too old and hasn't made comedic roles work, and you bring in Army Hammer, who has not made action roles work, I don't think their chemistry works together. Matt Damon and Terrence Howard have already been proven in these types of roles. They both have acting chops. They both have comedic acting chops. And I think they both work well in these particular roles, and they bring critical acclaim from this type of film to the DC universe. All right, okay. Jake, go ahead. Yeah. So you said that DC right now, they need critically acclaimed and they need good box office. And you want someone with both of them, and that's Denzel. He is bankable. He, most of his films, I think all of his films, have made a lot of money. Training Day. Um, I'm just blanking on my Denzel. Fences. Fences made money. Fences made, no, Fences made no money. <laughs> Fences made money, but more than its budget did. It, it makes money. He's also a critically acclaimed actor. He's been nominated for a crap ton of Oscars. He's won twice. You want someone who would be just that great, wise, and versatile, and very well-known actor like Denzel, and he would be going down, and he'd be teaching how, um, how Jordan, Army Hammer, the ways. Terrence Howard, when has he been relevant in the past 10 years? The last time he was relevant was freaking Iron Man, and he didn't want to do those type of films. I mean, he did Hustle and Flow, and that was a pretty good film. But that's regardless of the point. He does not want to work with big, big, big projects with DC or Marvel after how well they treated him with, with, with Iron Man. Matt Damon is not right. He's too old to be making these super films. Now, you're only saying them because Ben Affleck is, is, is Batman, and he would be perfect at Green Lantern. Matt Damon's too old. Do you want someone who's who will be able to who needs to be in his thirties? So that when they have when they sign their contracts, it will be in five sequels and crossovers. And Matt Damon, he's like in his what, his late forties? He's gonna be too old and tired to be doing that sort of crap. He wants to make great smaller well not smaller, but 
just critically acclaimed Oscar films. Superhero films, he, he saw what happened with Ben Affleck and how well he's done in Justice League. Ben Affleck wants out. You want two people, you want someone who the, who the audience knows who, and who people are going to go see, and you want someone who's who's rise, who's up and coming, and is going to be in these big, Holly, these big Hollywood films and is going to be well likable and someone who has proven to be a critically acclaimed actor. That's why I think uh, that's why I think that Army Hammer and Denzel Washington would be perfect because Denzel Washington would be able to pass the torch over to Army Hammer so that people would want to see Denzel first and then they would want to see Army Hammer. These two would work well together and I don't think that Matt Damon I think Matt Damon would be too old to be playing the main character and I think Terrence Howard would be un, it would be irrelevant to be playing this character. He hasn't done anything since Prisoners and that was a smaller film and before then it was Iron Man and nobody and he didn't want to work on any bigger film after that. All right, and as, as not as not part of the match, just for the record, there have been actors and directors who have come out of like retirement from not working on big films to crush it in giant things. Look at George Miller with Mad Max, that stricken mm -hmm. from the record, but he yeah. created Mad it's Max. Awesome. Nobody could have made it better than him. I'm surprised you didn't All mention right. Robert Downey Jr. I did. Did you? Yeah, I was talking about Robert Downey Jr. Oh, okay. All right, so I'm gonna run through real quick. Uh, I got all sorts of stuff. I got average <laughs> box. I got average box office. I got award nominations. I got ages. I got everything here. So let's run through this real fast. <laughs> talking about talking about awards nominations and wins. We'll start uh, with Roberts. Two guys, uh, Matt Damon and Terrence Howard. As an actor, Matt Damon has been nominated four times for Good Will Hunting, Invictus, The Martian, and Manchester. Oh wait, no, never mind. Three times. Yeah, Good Will Manchester. Hunting, Invictus, and The Martian. I was going to say Manchester by the Sea, that's Best Picture, but they all have it. Producing, producing. He was no, not for producing that. Right, right, right. Sorry. They have it all listed together. It's stupid. So he's been nominated three times. He has not won for acting. If we move on to Terrence Howard, Terrence Howard, uh, his only nomination for an Academy Award was for Hustle and Flow. He did not win. Uh, and also the question of how many blockbusters has he appeared in the last five years. Um, the only... Uh, actual blockbuster he appeared in in the last five years was in 2012. He starred in the movie Red Tails, if anybody remembers that. George and, Lucas. Uh, pace. Yeah, that'd be the George Lucas one. The closest to that was he appeared in the movie Sabotage, directed by David Ayer, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, although I would not call that a blockbuster. Um, other than that, moving on, so. Army Hammer has not been nominated for an Academy Award. The closest he's come was he got a SAG Award nomination for supporting role in J. Edgar. Uh, and then following him, him up, Denzel Washington has been nominated for Best Actor five times. Cry Freedom, Malcolm X, The Hurricane, Tri uh, Flight, and Fences. He's won twice for Glory and Training Day. Um, moving on after that, uh, you guys asked about ages. Tommy Lee Jones was 51 when he did the first Men in Black. Denzel Washington is currently 62 years of age. Moving on, also later, you asked about Matt Damon. Matt Damon is currently 47 years of age. Compare that to Ben Affleck, who is two years younger at 45. Um, you are talking about The Lone Ranger and the critical response. I did as much research as I could in the limited amount of time I had, but Army Hammer specifically was not one of the things that was bashed against critically within that movie. In the critical consensus on Rotten Tomatoes, he's actually listed as one of the positives. So just to put, put that out there. Uh, and then when talking about box office worth, I was able to find numbers on them. As a lead actor worldwide, Matt Damon has pulled in $5.3 billion as a lead actor in film. Terrence Howard has pulled in $1.3 billion. Um, or sorry, that's supporting. As a leading actor, he has pulled in $656,000 worldwide. So there's a considerable difference there. When looking at the other two, Army Hammer's leading actor has pulled in $487,000 worldwide. And Denzel Washington has pulled in three point eight billion dollars as leading actor worldwide. So it's mm. it's pretty close between Matt and Denzel. And then the last thing was talking about the financial success of Fences. Fences made sixty four point four million dollars worldwide on a twenty four million dollar budget. So the movie was a All success. Right. Fair. With that being said, um, I think you guys both made a lot of good arguments for both of your actors. And I think both of you guys did a really good job of bouncing back and forth and attacking the points that were put out there. So unfortunately, I hate when it does this, but it's going to come down to two very specific points. 
The first was a knock against Terrence Howard where you talked about Iron Man and the experience with that and how that may affect mm -hmm. him and wanting to jump back into one of these because you can find it. It was a, it, you know, for those of you who don't know what the incident was, basically um, Terrence Howard was one who got Robert Downey Jr. the job on the first Iron Man. When they went into the second one, they upped Robert Downey Jr.'s contract. Terrence Howard wanted the money up as well. They said no, and he left because of it, which is why he was replaced with Don Cheadle. Um, and, and there was a whole issue with it, and he's been very public about the fact that he basically feels gypped by Marvel for not getting the pay raise on the movie. Um, but then the other thing was, and even if I don't agree with the point of it, Jake did bring up with his two actors, specifically on the age front, you would have a, a Men in Black vibe to the movie, and you could see how the pairing works. Robert talked about how the individual actors would work great in their roles, possibly, but didn't bring up any sort of example to try and compare the chemistry the two could have on screen. And for that, I'm going to have to give Jake the point on this round. Yeah. Yes. I've yeah. Automatically done better than my first match. I knew that was going to happen. I should have done Michael good. B. Jordan instead of Terrence Howard. Oh, shit. Good, but I that'd be really good. good. I know. I, I was. I was I was on the fence. I was like, man, like you, you took Army Hammer. That was my first choice. Uh, oh, really? Wow. My, my initial first choice is going to be Armor Hammer and Michael B. Jordan. But then I'm like, oh, man, Michael B. Jordan and Matt Damon wouldn't work together. And I don't really have another replacement besides Matt Damon. Like that. Yeah. yeah. I Answering second kind of screwed me over there, but that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Right, I was guys. thinking, so I was, I was, I was, sorry, I was going to go with Michael B. Jordan, but he was in Fantastic Four and he was already in the Marvel films. So I just thought to myself, that might be that that could be used as the, the yeah. Value. I stand by the fact that Zell's too old to play that role. But that's that's fair. That's fine. <laughs> I think that that is a fair criticism. Yeah, it's all good. It's a little too old. Um. All right. So with that, guys, the score is tied to two. We're gonna move yeah. into the speed round now. Uh, just because. Of recording mishaps, I don't know what's going to air in what order, so just every video I record for the next couple, I'm going to explain this, but we're changing the rules on the speed round and how it works. So previously, the way it used to work was the time limit was 2010, and then if you got into the final round, we'd extend it to 3020. We're changing that up now. You guys are going to have, it's still going to be speed round, but you guys are going to have longer to talk. It's going to be 30 and 15, and then if it's tied up 3 3 and we go to the final question, it's going to be 30, 20, and then 10. You get 10 final seconds to put something in at the end there. And this is just so we can still keep it at a quick pace and keep everything moving along, but it also allows you guys to speak more and get more in because we had a lot of instances, especially recently, of, you know, me or whoever's hosting going time and the person's still trying to get out what they're trying to say. Mm -hmm. So it just seems like the admins agreed it would just be a better motion to just extend the time a little bit and let you guys get a little more in. But because we're still cutting on the argument and keeping you to a strict time limit, um, it makes it easier. So, with that being said, with this first question, I have two options, and whoever says it first is going to get that answer. And this is just because I was really bored and trying to think of the most random-ass questions I could write. Who is the better Antonio Banderas character, Zorro or Puss in Boots? Zorro. Puss in Boots. Perfect. All right, Jake is going to go first with Zorro. Robert follows up with Puss in Boots. Jake, 30 seconds on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. When you think of legendary heroic characters, you think of people like Robin Hood. You think of Atticus Finch. You think of T. Lawrence. You also think of Zorro, who is one of the greatest vigilantes, one of the greatest swashbuckling outlaws of his age. Zorro is a much greater charismatic character. Puss in Boots is just a ripoff of Zorro. Everything that you like about Puss in Boots, you like about Zorro. Zorro is one of those characters that is just instantly likable, and every time you think of Zorro, you think of Antonio Banderas. Perfect. And time. Robert, move to you. 30 seconds on the clock when you begin speaking. Literally everything you just said about Zorro also applies to Puss in Boots. Puss in Boots not only has a great role, uh, a supporting role in uh, the Shrek movie he was in, he also had his own spin-off movie. You get more time with him. You can delve deeper into his backstory. You don't get enough about Zorro. Yes, Antonio Banderas is good in the movie. His voice is very recognizable. But he's not 
like a, a super recognizable character. Puss in Boots, everyone knows that. Plus, he's real cute. Zoro's not very cute, but as far as recognizing with Antonio Banderas, a great vigilante, a great swordsman, a great just character to watch on screen and see what they're gonna do next with their action set pieces, right. it's Puss in Boots. All right, Jake, 15 seconds when you begin speaking. There are two Zorro films. There's only one Puss in Boots film, and that's a spin-off of a film of a, of a franchise that's not even centered on Puss in Boots. Zorro, it's its own entity. Puss in Boots is just a side character that got its own spin-off because it was a rip-off of Zorro. And time. Robert, 15 seconds. Just because my character has fewer movies doesn't make them a worse Antonio Banderas character. Anthony Hopkins was a better Zorro than Antonio Banderas was. Antonio Antonio Banderas is a ripoff of the Anthony Hopkins character. Puss in Boots is its own entity. Just because it has fewer films doesn't make it a worse character. It is a better swashbuckling character. Okay. Alright. Good, good arguments, guys. It's tough, because I, I, I definitely think, and it is fair, and it is a part of the question, obviously, because we all know that one is a rip-off of the other, clearly. And and Jake did take the easy argument, not that it's a bad one, but he took the easy argument of saying that it it, it is a rip-off of the character. But I like the way that Robert took that and twisted it and went, yeah, it is a rip-off of the character, but it's also used in these different ways within the, this franchise, he talked about the supporting role in the Shrek movies. He talked about the spinoff. Um, he brought up the Anthony Hopkins character. I think I'm going to give it to Robert on that one. It was close, but I'm, I'm going to give it to Robert. That's a weird oh, question, that man. Is, that is a weird question. That's a, it's a little one-sided, but, I mean, that was a good argument. Yeah, Anthony I Hopkins. Mean, I honestly do think Anthony Hopkins is better. I mean, he's not Spanish. I feel that's the the main criticism that the film yeah. got is that the main Zorro isn't even of Spanish descent. But I think I don't know. What I mean, about uh, Antonio you know, Banderas? Is the main character in the Shrek franchise, and then he got his own spinoff. I mean, Zorro is yeah. the main character; he's one of the most iconic. But that's just me complaining. Only one. <laughs> All right, guys, Sorry. we're gonna move on. We're gonna move on to question number two. So. Uh, at least at the time of recording this, whenever it goes up, this movie may already be out of theaters, but Titanic is getting a week-long 3D re-release. Who's excited about that? Nope. Mm -mm. I'm actually going to see it because I've never seen Titanic, so I figured, why not? Well, that's a shame. Yeah, I I'm probably going <laughs> to see it. The, the theater that I work at just put in one of those like new um, exclusive theaters where they got like, the leather recliners that move and shit, so I'm mm -hmm. probably going to go see it in that. Mm -hmm. But, um... With that being said, and the, uh, the, the time limit I'll set on this is at least 20 years ago, because it is Titanic's 20-year anniversary, but what classic movie deserves a week-long re-release like Titanic is getting? And if you have questions about dates, I can fact-check them. So it has to be at least 20 years? At least 20 years, because that is why Titanic is getting re-released for the 20-year anniversary. Hmm. Jesus Christ. If the question is too hard or takes nope. too long, I can discard it. I have an answer. I'm waiting for him to answer first. <laughs> If you have an answer, you can throw it out there because it will force him to have Back to answer to the you. Future. Okay. What's my uh, time? You get. I'll, I'll give you a little bit longer to think about it, but if it takes too long, then I have to force a five count. Okay. Um. Oh my god. Uh. Uh, Star Wars. A New Hope. Okay. That works. Alright. Robert, you're going to go ahead and go first. Mm. 30 seconds on the clock to argue Back to the Future versus the original Star Wars. Mm. 
Back to the Future is one of the most perfect films of all time. It has an amazing cast, perfect cast, perfect direction, perfect visuals, perfect music, perfect everything. Back to the Future is a perfect movie. People want to go see this movie. People have seen this movie through, through their childhood. Adults want to go take their kids to this movie. Star Wars, everybody has seen it. Everybody, it's been overdone. We have way too much Star Wars. We are overindulged with Star Wars in our society. We have too much of it. We don't need a Star Wars re-release because, okay, then it's just going to be a bunch of sweaty nerds going to see Star Wars again. Back to the Future is something that has themes that can teach kids about what the, right. th how things work. All right, Jake, 30 seconds. Forty years ago, it was 1977. Guess what film came out then? Star Wars. So it'd be perfect time to release it for the 40th year anniversary. Last year is coming out. It'd be perfect. Not a lot of people have seen Star Wars in the cinema. Most people who have watched the films are, ch are children and teenagers who never got to experience watching Star Wars in the theater. So now would be the perf perfect time to see it in the theater because Last year is coming out. Everyone would enjoy it. It'd be great to see the film in its entirety on the big screen like so many people never got the chance to do before. And time. Robert, 15 seconds. Star Wars is something that tears people apart. Which version are you going to do? The re-release? The original? What are you going to do? Who knows? People are going to get divisive about this instantly. This generation has their own Star Wars. They have their Force Awakens. They have their Rogue One. They have their Last Jedi. They're not going to want to go see the original just because it's the original. It's dated. Uh, I'm sorry. It's dated. They're uh, going to want to see their generation uh, of Star Wars. All right. 15 seconds. There's no reason to re-release Back to the Future. Are you going to show them the original version with Eric Stoltz? No, you show Star Wars, you show the original version. The original one that people saw in 1977 just because it is the 40th year anniversary. There's a reason to re-release it. There's no reason to re-release Back to the Future. People have already seen that. It's a fun film, but it's fine. It's whatever. Right. Star Wars is a cultural film. All right. <sighs> Robert had a great one. And I won't take that. Yeah. Robert, do you hate Star Wars? No, I love fashion. Star Wars. That was a fucking great pick. That was a fantastic pick. Like, I know you're going to go with him. It? I know that you're going to go with him. Uh, so I'm just <laughs> saying that right away. Guys, he did win. But, I, th I think he yeah. won it there. Yes. Yeah. Um, but that, that was, was a great pick. Just, just to critique the argument, that was a great opening from Robert. You got a lot out that mattered and good. really helped your argument. Good. You lost yourself a little bit in the second part. Yeah. Yeah. Um, whereas I, I think Jake followed through on his argument and he, he did a good job in both halves. So Yeah, he definitely won that. I should have done my Padme impression. Damn it. <laughs> oh, that wasn't one you had. <laughs> yeah, that was a damn that's a good pick. And uh, guys, the first one I said, like, oh, that's not good. I could come up with something better, but then when I realized, wait, it's the fortieth anniversary. Yeah. That, that was an interesting angle. I I wasn't thinking about that, but that was, that was an interesting angle. Okay, so, with that, guys, the score is all tied up 3-3. Three to three. No, matter, oh my no, gosh. no matter who wins here, oh, I don't think anyone oh. can deny that you guys haven't proved yourself by this point, but there is only one of you that will win. The thing that sucks and is that one guys, of us is going to be 0-2 after this match. <laughs> yeah. And we both it, 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 you've done really well today. Oh, so have you, Jake. This has been great. Oh, thank you. This, this, is has, been, crazy, this has been amazing. All right, a after this, just to keep the trio alive, me and Robert need to fight. We need to have Jake host just one time. <laughs> <laughs> just we can complete, 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 complete the cycle. Complete the cycle. Yes. <laughs> um. No, but but um. <laughs> like I said, again, when this up when this uploads, no fucking clue. But at the time of recording, we are fresh off the heels. Of this little indie movie trailer called Avengers Infinity War. I don't know if you guys ever heard of this. It's based on some what's, what's, picture book. What's Avengers? What? It's got like a bunch of has been actors in is it. Is that a Is them? that one of the one of those animes? Is that what that is? is Maybe the, is I don't know. The one of the, was it the film with Sean Connery the, and Huma Thurman? Maybe yeah, that was a great poll. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Yeah, that was a good poll. <laughs> 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 Hey, that was great! Wow, that might have been be that might have been better than the Star Wars poll, to be honest. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. All right, we're changing the question. Best performance in 1998's The Avengers. Is this I true? I the pink teddy bear. No, 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 I'm kidding. No, this is not real. I, I would be like, wait, that was. I actually haven't even seen that film. <laughs> 
off the heels of Avengers Infinity War trailer, which character excites you the most to see in Avengers Infinity War? Thanos. Fair pick. Robert? Yep, and there's a... One, one second. There's a lot of them. Like, 67 or some shit. There's a lot of them. Captain America. Okay, perfect. I was scared we were going to have to say spoilers for Thor Ragnarok, but we should be okay. No, that... My mind went there first, but... No. Oh, well. Okay. All right. Jake, you're up first. Remember, guys, we're doing the extended formats. You think about everything you want to say. You got 30, then 20, then 10. Jake, you are up first. Go ahead for Thanos. Okay. Ever since they hinted at Thanos in the first Avengers film in 2012, we have been excited. We have been waiting to see this powerful villain come to the, the Marvel Cinematic Universe and actually be the villain that they have been teasing for so long. They've been teasing it throughout every single film, and we're finally going to see him do exactly what he set out to do, and that is to get the Infinity Stones. He is absolutely powerful. Josh Bolin is one of the greatest actors, and he's playing Thanos, and I can't wait to see what Thanos does and how he completely destroys most of these superheroes and get the Infinity Stones and prove that he is the absolute greatest villain. All right, Robert, 30 seconds. The trailer actually made me less excited to see Thanos because first off, he looks like what his he looks super weird. I don't like the CGI on him at all. Uh, he looks super weird. As far as collecting the Infinity Stones, we don't see him doing that. We see Loki doing it for him. We see his minions doing it for him. We see a giant CGI army doing it for him. We don't see him doing it. I bet you this entire movie is just going to be them teasing him more because that's all Marvel has done with this character is tease and tease and tease, and it's not going to culminate in this film. It will not. As for Captain America, the Russo brothers. Gate 20 seconds on the clock. In the trailer, Captain America doesn't even do much. All he does is you see him run and he fights a small little alien. He has a freaking beard if you want to talk about characters looking weird. Thanos is fine. Thanos is what we do. In an in a interview, we saw that Russo wanted him to take off his armor because it was a very symbolic and powerful thing because he's got the Infinity Stones. You see him put the Infinity Stones in his gauntlet. He's powerful. He's right. destroying Spider-Man and Iron Man. He's Robert called the Mad Titan. Titan. I wanted to see him with some armor. That beard is amazing on Captain America. We see Captain America having abandoned his identity. He is no longer Captain America. He ripped the tag off of his Avengers uniform. He is a new character. He is reborn. I'm excited to see him and Bucky's dynamic again. The Rooster Brothers have masterfully handled this character for the last many, many years. For the last three, four years, they've handled this character. I'm ready to see what they're going to do with right. him again. He's going to lead the team again. All right, Jake, final 10 seconds. We've seen three Captain America films. I'm done. I'm tired of Captain America. I want to see something new. We're finally going to see Thanos do something. We haven't seen him this much before. He's the villain. He's going to do something that we have not seen. I don't want to see Captain America anymore. We've seen him before. All right, Robert, go ahead. I'll give you an extra second or two there, but go ahead. All we're going to see out of Thanos is CGI armies and sky beams. I don't need to see that. That's all we're going to see. We haven't seen anything that's going to lead us to... We've never seen anything that's going to give us interest in this character. We've seen something that's going to lead us into interest in this Captain America character. Again, right. just finish his arc. Oh, oh shit. Wow. That was really close. Uh, Aaron, before you decide, can I just... I want to say good luck, Robert. That was... I yeah, yeah, you too, good. Jake. I, I love you anymore. I love you, Jake. It's all good. It's gonna be okay. I, I, I love you too, Robert. This is fun. I don't care who wins. <laughs> this is the most loving episode of Movie Battleground I've ever seen. Yeah, except fuck it's inside out. Positivity. <laughs> positivity all the way. <sighs> oh, God. <laughs> Guys, I'm scared. Unfortunately, I'm really scared. Unfortunately, in terms of penalizing the actual argument structure, Robert spent 30 seconds bashing Thanos 
without honestly getting enough out there and he did try to jump to captain america at the last second it's just unfortunately i think he had something to say and he just ran on a little too long saying it and i don't think he was able to come back afterwards i think he felt the rush of having to recover that and get something out there mm-hmm. i think that jake did a better job on that one and with that jake takes the yeah. match oh. that's accurate oh my god yeah, it's wow. nice that I at least have your backing on that. No, I'm not gonna. Yeah, mm-hmm. you're right. In round one, I talked about Thanos for too long, and I was about to talk about wow. the Russo brothers, but I didn't get to it till my third round. So at that point, it was too late. No, um, <laughs> you're absolutely right. Yeah, that was shit. a really this good was, argument. Though, this was one of you can one of the best matches. Oh, that was so Thanos, good. And I was like, oh, how do, where do I come back from that? I thought oh. I thought the sky beams and CGI army were gonna get me. I thought, I thought that was going to get you as well. I was like, oh, damn it. That's right. Oh, wow. That's all right. Oh, man. That was fun, Jake. <laughs> that was so much fun. I feel much better than my first uh, battle. I have certainly, I think I certainly have improved. I just, yeah, there was a lot that I needed to work on in my first match. And I think, I think I'm, I'm ready. I think I finally, finally found my, my footing in this league. Definitely. Um, Obviously, uh, Jake, we will see. I don't think we we don't have room, unfortunately, to get either of you guys another match before the end of the year. So we'll just have to see where the ranking falls at the end of the year. If one or both of you can sneak into the tournament, yeah, that's fine. Um, we'll go ahead. We'll go ahead, we'll go ahead and start with Robert first, man. Robert, how are you feeling after that? I honestly feel good. Like I'm a little disappointed I didn't win. Um, but I, if you watch my first match and watch this match, I think. I have improved so much. So I'm going for most improved player. Uh, I'm not going for the most number of wins, but I think I've improved so much uh, on the structure of my arguments, on my preparedness. Um, I all, all props to Jake. That was a hell of a fight down to the last 10 seconds. The entire, or however long this was, complete great arguments for both of us, I thought. Um, I think I had a couple missteps where I just ran out of time and got discouraged with my loss of time. Um, but yeah, I'm not ashamed of how I did. I, I think that it was all judged fairly and I think I brought what I could. Well, no, no one should be ashamed. Jake, we'll go to you, man. How are you feeling? Uh, first, heads off to Robert. That was a, a much thought fought battle. He pulled every punch out. I had to receive it. I had to bring it back and all I have is just recognition to Robert for what he did. And I am very happy that I that I've won. I'm, I don't want to brag, but I'm just I, I'm feeling pretty good. This this win has certainly made me feel much more confident in this league, especially after how I say, how bad I did in my first match. And I, I can admit that, but um, I think yeah, I've, I've I've definitely I feel much more confident going forward. And yeah, whenever whenever you got a match ready, I'm, I'm happy to come in. And, and, and play. Definitely. This is a lot of fun. I don't have anything set in stone in front of me right now. Obviously, we do still have a couple matches left for the end of the year. Robert, unfortunately, with an 0-2 record, I, don't, I think it'll yeah. be hard to get you into that tournament. It's all um, That's fine. As long as I get to kick Supra stats at some point. <laughs> well, we'll, 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 well, not any time in the near future. Well, You've yeah. done yeah. too well despite your losses. Yeah. Um, Jake, on the other hand... You know, maybe somewhere in that 15th or 16th seed, you know, just one of the players that sneaks in there right at the bottom. You got a good shot, you know, just despite the loss and now the one you put in two good performances. Uh, we'll just have to see how the rest of these matches shake out. But um, we'll go ahead and start with Jake. Where can people find you? Uh, people can find me on Twitter at Pretentious Hack. The P and the H are caps. Uh, I don't really do much on Twitter. Um, I'm, I was in the uh, There Will Be Trivia Snowball. I went up against Brooklyn Vow. I won't tell you what happens, but uh, when you yeah, think I don't know the when they're releasing that. that. Yeah, I don't know when they're releasing that. I, I assume it's in the next soon. couple soon. Soon. I hope so, because when you see me there, you'll, you'll realize how strong the alphas are going to be in the team tournament. Definitely. And Robert, where can people find you? Sure. So you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd at RBRTPRK. 
Fair 98. It's a stupid handle. I know. Get over it. Um, other than that, you can find me hosting a couple matches here and there here on the Movie Battleground. I really enjoy hosting. I love competing, but I think hosting is where, personally, I think I shine the most as far as analyzing people's arguments. Um, you can also find me, again, as Jake just plugged in, that there will be Trivia Snowball, as the finals of Season 2. I take on Greg Weinstein for the championship of Season 2 of There Will Be Trivia. It's an awesome match so make sure you check that out. Otherwise, I'm all over the There Will Be Trivia. I'm going to be the statistician for the upcoming league, so I'm super excited about that. And yeah, just check me out over there. And uh, once again, big thanks to Aaron, and congrats to Jake. Most definitely, Robert, Jake, great game, both you guys. This was a lot of fun to judge. Um, as always, I am scared to have a heart attack because of some of these matches. It's really, really fun. Um, <laughs> I, I literally feel stressed doing this. Like, it's it's scary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, you guys can find me on Instagram at Aaron T. Canole. If you guys are not subscribed to the YouTube channel, subscribe. It's the only way you guys are going to see the matches. If you guys are not a part of the Facebook group, Movie Battleground, the only way to play a match is to join in there and get involved. Um, like I've been saying in the last couple videos, unfortunately, because of booked out for the rest of the year, tournament starting off next year, we're, we're looking at March or April before we can start getting new people involved. But just you know, watch all the videos, watch all the content we're releasing, and... Uh, Stay up on it. You guys will eventually get your shot once we get around to it. Um, other than that, uh, support all our other admins, whether it be Robert, Andrew, Linus, Matt, Subrath. I think I got them all that time. But um, like I said, guys, like, rate, subscribe, comment, all those other things. I think like and rate are the same thing. But I'm tired. It's late. My name is Ben I'll see you guys next time on Movie Battle Down. Take care.